To kick off our amazing Earth Summit today is uh, Rachel Payne, uh, Portfolio Director at Climate Moonshots X, the moonshot factory that uh, Google uh, is a subsidi subsidiary of Google. Um, and uh, Rachel's really going to be, you know, talking through her experience as an entrepreneur, an investor, uh, uh, trying to go into politics, right? Um, and uh, it's really going to be able to really help set the tone for the rest of the day. After that, we'll go into a discussion about, uh, from LA County's point of view, uh, the carbon footprint of LA, and then we'll go into some lightning talks. We'll have some breaks in between, of course, and then we'll go into two panel discussions. And so, without further ado, uh, give it up for Rachel Payne. I'm here to talk about our Earth. So we're going to do a quick visualization exercise. I want all of you to close your eyes, and I want you to think about your favorite place on Earth, the most beautiful place that just brings you solace and joy. I want you to remember how it feels, the sounds. Just really sink into that feeling, ground into that knowing of what it's like to be in your favorite place on this beautiful planet. Aren't we lucky? I just want to send a huge wish of gratitude out into the universe. Thank you for this beautiful planet. Can we do that? Thank you. When we think about AI and the opportunities, especially when it comes to planetary issues, there's a lot that's happening around data and sensing. But I want to ask you this question, and I'd like you to keep this question in mind throughout the day. Who's listening to the Earth? Whose voices are we listening to? Because this is the reality of what a lot of the world is seeing right now. The Anthropocene has been a place, an era, an experience of exponential growth and development, but it's also at the cost of many other living beings on the planet that we share. Average decline of 69% globally, and that gets worse as we look at regions. One million animal and plant species are facing extinction within the next decade. When you look at regions like Latin America, you see a 94% loss since 1970. That's fast. When you think about the places we love in the world, we're losing them. We're losing them faster than we can blink. And when we think about what we can do about all this, it seems insurmountable. But I actually have good news. In December of 2022, COP15, also known as the UN Biodiversity Conference, established for the first time a global biodiversity framework that the countries of the world have agreed to, to help us try and stem this tide of loss globally. What caused it? So we talk about growth and progress and development. There's a term, if you haven't heard it yet, called the Great Acceleration. You'll see in every single chart, whether it's population growth, GDP growth, fertilizer consumption, energy use, urban population, Tourism, telecommunications, transportation, the human species, we're doing great, right? All this progress, all this development, we have made so much, we've made leaps and bounds of technological advancement. And that's great. And also, it's been unbounded growth, exponential growth. And you look at, by regions, OECD, BRICS countries, and others, water use, paper production, all the different ways that regionally we're seeing differences. The theme is mass growth, right? The human civilization has had a historical pattern over tens of thousands of years. Lots of growth and then die off. Lots of growth and die off. I don't know if anyone's ever read Jared Diamond's Collapse. Amazing book. Love this book. I actually went and visited many of the archaeological sites that he cited in his book. And there's this whole notion of humans who destroy our ecosystem, destroy ourselves. And sometimes you wonder, are we ever going to learn? And that brings us to climate change. The, oh, the great acceleration, hold on, let's make sure. Okay. The great acceleration has led to a lot of Earth trends as well. So when we talk about the Anthropocene, 
What we're talking about is the human influence on our planet, which in geologic terms, it's a blink of an eye. It's like the last 30 seconds of a year in the historical record. So when you think about what does that mean for our planet, it means we are changing the planet faster than the planet and everything on it can adapt, right? And a great example of that is global warming. The average temperature is increasing year over year over year. And when we say average, we know averages are not that meaningful because it could be many, many degrees hotter in the poles. So you think the Arctic melting ice, Antarctic, we've got the Thwaites Glacier that could go any day. These are real examples of what averages mean and don't mean because they lose their meaning when you just look at that picture. And we think about, well, where are all these emissions coming from? Because we know CO2 emissions are the cause of climate change, right? So let's go deeper. Let's understand where are all of these emissions coming from? This is annually. But let's go a little bit deeper. Cumulative emissions, no one ever likes to talk about cumulative emissions, but they're a very big factor because CO2 stays in the atmosphere pretty much forever. Unlike methane, which degrades over about 20 years, CO2 is pretty much permanent unless we do something to remove it, sequester it, etc. We've depended for so long on the earth and its natural systems to be natural carbon sinks. The ocean in particular has spared us from the fate that we are now embarking on, we didn't even know how much damage we were doing because the Earth just took care of it. But it can't just keep taking care of it. We're now at that tipping point. What determines total CO2 emissions? This is a very rough equation. People in the room like equations, so here's math. Um, <clears throat> when you think about population, emissions per capita, and emissions per capita, of course, is determined by a few things, technology, lifestyles, consumption, things like that. That gives you your basic formula for how emissions are generated. And then if you look at that in a deeper way, uh, this is a Hans Rosling type slide, who is, Hans was one of my mentors, amazing, brilliant researcher, um, rest in peace. Uh, but this is an example of how you can understand how to overlay population with income to really understand deeply what does it mean? How do we attribute the source of these emissions? And if we were to rank it by combining territorial and consumption emissions, and what that means is you can't just have your manufacturing outsourced and then not count the emissions from manufacturing just because you're consuming all that stuff. This means you actually have to account for the things you're consuming and the emissions that were associated with that consumption as well as what's generated in your own region. And this tells you something about cumulative attribution, right? We call this debtors or overshooters. So that raises the prospect of climate justice because fundamentally climate change is a justice issue. Those who created the problem are not the ones on the front lines of the issue. Those who had nothing to do with generating the emissions are the ones that are suffering now. This is a woman in Bangladesh who's searching for food for her children because they've had extreme cyclones. I don't know if anyone remembers the flooding in Pakistan that it affected nearly half the population and their emissions per capita are among the lowest in the world. <clears throat> I think about people like this. I actually served on a board of an organization called BRAC, B-R-A-C, world's largest NGO. Nobody ever knows about them. They don't brag. They don't market. And they, they were born out of Bangladesh. And one of the issues I got to work with the great Mary Robinson on, actually, who was on the, our board as well, is climate injustice. So climate injustice is when you have people suffering who didn't create the problem. And what does that mean? Well, if we look at what overshoot means, is another term, sorry, lots of new terms today. Overshoot is when we are mo moving past the boundaries of not only what's allowable from a carbon budget standpoint, but it also means we're taking from others. And in our case, it's the future generations mainly as well as all of these other populations who are wondering, what happened? 
Why isn't it raining anymore? Why is it raining so much? Why, why is there all these, this, this great die-off around me? Why are my children hungry? These are the questions that people are asking because they can't understand what they had to do with the problem. Well, they didn't. <laughs> they actually didn't. So these are debtor nations. These are the nations that have taken more than their fair share. The fair share, by the way, is here, the little blue line. And the undershoot countries, which are the creditors, they're the ones who are lending you all this extra carbon. The creditors are here, the undershoot emissions cumulatively. But it gets more interesting. Not all emissions are the same. In fact, when you think about consumption emissions, it doesn't just include what you buy, what you eat. It also includes what you do with your money. And this gets very interesting because 125 people generate 400 million emissions every year. Huh. Think about that. And mainly through their investments. Yeah, jets, they emit a lot of <laughs> emissions into the air and so do all these properties. But if you just aligned your financial portfolio with your emissions or maybe even just aligned it with the future generations, you would actually cut a huge amount of that, right? Like just... Think about your total financial portfolio and making it fit with growth, as in survivability of our species. If you look at the richest 1%, they are 30 times more than the allocated carbon budget of the average person. And this is based on a 1.5 degrees Celsius trajectory, which we all kind of know is probably not going to be achievable. We're Lucky maybe if we can get to two degrees warming. I mean, hopefully, but it's not looking great. But on a 1.5 degree pathway, it's 30 times over the allocated budget. And if you look at it by income group, um, by the way, this is the 1.5 degree <laughs> threshold <laughs> for livability. <laughs> so it gives you a sense of where and how we can take action, right? Numbers are great that way. So let's talk about climate action, something optimistic. Um, so, you know, it's the AILA summit, so I asked a friendly chat bot, hey, <laughs> what's climate change and how do we take action? Thanks, Bard. And you know, it's not actually, it's not too far off. You know, when you look at all the solutions here, I'm like, those are pretty good. <laughs> I actually didn't edit anything. I, this is as is. And then I thought, well, come on, let's make it personal. Let's bring it down to the individual. And here we go. This is what the individual can do. So I was like, okay, not bad. I'm just verbatim. This is what, this is what was recommended. And yeah, I agree. Um, actually, let me go back one slide. One thing I wanted to point out is that the recommendation is that governments, businesses, and individuals all have a role to play. I'm a big believer in that. It takes all of us. And you know, we've done that before. We can, as humans, do that. We've, we know how to take collective action. We know how to collaborate. We know how to innovate. And that's what's really exciting. When I think about governments, for the first time in the US, we've actually had consequential climate legislation that has catalyzed an entire industry. How many in this room have heard about the IRA? Yeah, or the BIL? Bipartisan infrastructure, yes. Or the CHIPS Act. Right, like this is a moment where we can actually be really proud of our country and say, hey, you're investing a lot in this issue. You're helping kickstart a ton of new businesses and opportunities, and you're making it possible for investors to invest in a long-term future scenario of decarbonization because that's where policy actually makes a difference. So congrats, all of us. And look at this room, right? We're in a thriving climate tech ecosystem. We built this. We, all of us. So it's totally possible. And we can align all of these stakeholders. And I'm sorry if your name's not on here. I tried to be comprehensive, but you know, a little hard. But look at what we've built. In a very short amount of time, we have assembled an incredible ecosystem of players in the climate tech world who are all firmly committed and passionate about this issue. Well done, us all. 
And if we think about how do we protect our planet, I just want to push us to take a little step further and think about nature-based solutions. Because anything we do in climate ultimately has to link back to the planet. And so how do we help reinforce Earth's natural systems? How do we protect our planet? The biodiversity framework is a great example. And there's many, many, many others. But also, how do we protect those who protect the planet? That's another area that we need to focus more on. And how do we make sure that those who are suffering have adaptation resources, skills, strategies, and access? I want to leave us with this, which is new leaders have emerged to help us step into this new future. And I just welcome all of us to think of ourselves as leaders. Whatever your domain is, whatever your job is, whatever your role is, you are a leader in your domain, and you can lead from your vantage point. And that's what we need. We need everyone aligned, working together, being creative, being innovative, and remembering the bigger picture, taking a holistic view of what it's going to take for us to do this so that the sixth mass extinction doesn't include us. I would like to say, it's remembering that place we started from in the very beginning, when you closed your eyes and the things that brought you joy about nature, because we are nature. And the sooner we accept and remember and realize that the interconnectedness of all of us is a reminder that we are nature, then we remember that we are planet Earth. Thank you.